This video is sponsored by Ecosia. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome. My name's Charlie, and today I'm gonna be playing 100 Days in Stardew Valley, except it's Pokemon. With the help of the wonderful cat noodles, I put together a mega mod pack that transforms practically everything in Pelican Town into the world of Pokemon. Pelican Town, if you will. The buildings are different, the weapons are Pokeballs, and every single forgeable animal, fish, monster, and honestly everything else has been retextured into Pokemon. My goal is simple, to catch them all. What are the legendary fish gonna be? What Pokemon will Crobus be? And why on this good sweet earth did Pam get turned into this monstrosity? You'll have to watch to find out. So without further ado, let's jump right into our first day in Pokemon Stardew Valley. Our first day on Poke Farm began like any other, except that I was dressed as Ash Ketchum, the legendary Pokemon trainer. Rest his soul. Or is he still alive? I honestly have no idea. After picking up my parsnip seeds, I headed outside and realized my farmhouse was in fact a gym, which meant only one thing. I'm a gym leader. I'm just like my dad, Norman. And as I approached my Pokeball-themed shipping bin, I spotted my very first Pokemon. There's a Charizard in there? This is nuts. I continued to explore my farm and spotted a Butterfree and Ladybug just flying around before planting my parsnips and watering them with my trusty horsey can. With that done, I then ventured into town with the singular mission of filling up my Pokedex. Embarrassingly, I tried to hit this combi with an axe, which really didn't work out for me, but I did end up finding a bunch of Pokemon on the beach. The rest of the evening was spent in town introducing myself to the villagers, all the while keeping an eye out for new Pokemon. In the forest next to the wizard tower, I caught a glimpse of an animal scampering up a tree, but wasn't fast enough to identify it. Get out of there, you. <laughs> and I ended off the day by chopping some trees and crafting a chest that would serve as my Pokedex. Going to bed that night with eight new entries. First thing the next morning, I watered my crops and took a beeline to the beach to pick up what would become my most valuable Pokemon catching device, which isn't a Pokeball, no, 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 but a fishing rod. While I was there, I found a couple more Pokemon as well as my first artifact spot, which was this little Pokeball on the ground. Using my trusty fishing rod, I began my career as a Pokemon fisherman. My plan for the next couple weeks was to fish like no one's ever fished before because I needed to catch every fish in each season and in order to catch the legend, our first legendary fish, I'd have to get to fishing level 10 before the end of spring. It's a tip! Pull. After nabbing a Timpole and Goldeen from the river, I walked down to the beach and got a Remoraid as well. I managed to reach fishing level one, meaning I was still a long ways away from catching the legend, but you know, progress is progress. It was raining the next morning, which meant it was the perfect day to go fishing. I spent the entire day at the ocean, snatching an electric and even a Galarian Stunfisk. And I might've been going a little crazy standing on the dock so long because I started bargaining with the fish. I already have two Electrosses. You're gonna have a little family. Wouldn't that be lovely? You're so lonely in the deep ocean. <laughs> I'm selling you. Pockets filled with a ton of new Pokemon, I returned home having reached fishing level two. By day four, I realized I hadn't checked out the shops much, so I headed to Pierre's to see if he was selling anything of the special Pokemon variety. <gasps> ooh, ooh, oh my gosh, guys, there's pokey, pokey fruits. I bought five of each berry, which was a real hit to the wallet. With the 60 measly gollars I had left, I got a single bean starter and then planted those little debbies before heading to the mountain lake to do some more fishing. Once I'd had my fill, I headed to Gus's saloon to cap off the night, spotting a little Bulbasaur dashing into the woods as I did so. It turns out Gus was selling fish tacos that day, which I really wanted because they give you the plus two fishing buff. But unluckily, I had spent all my money on berries that morning. I sat there for a while formulating a plan to acquire said taco, but eventually I had to be honest with myself. I could not afford the taco. With deep sadness, I scrounged around the town's garbage bins like a pathetic little rat, scoring a baguette and then conking out right in front of my house. Pennyless, taco-less, but also fishing level three. As if my disappointment couldn't go any deeper, I found Marnie at my door the next morning with a very upsetting pet. Oh, come on, Marnie. You're kidding. That's what you brought me? Full disclosure, I am not a fan of Glam Meow. I almost don't even want it. You know what else I'm not a fan of? The drastic decline of trees on this good sweet earth. That's why I'm extremely excited that today's video is sponsored by Ecosia, the search engine that turns your web searches into trees. Now, a typical search search engine displays ads as you search to make money, which goes God knows where. With Ecosia, 100% of the profits go directly toward helping the environment. Stardew player to Stardew player, we've all cut down every single tree in Cindersat Forest and felt the devastating impact on this peaceful pixel environment.
environment. But unlike in the valley, real trees that are deforested don't just respawn. With Ecosia though, you can easily make a difference in the world. I mean, in a single hour long session playing Stardew, I racked up enough searches to plant two whole trees. That's two whole trees that never would have existed had I not been looking up where the frick Marnie is. The thing that's incredible about Ecosia too is that they direct support to areas that need trees the most, like vulnerable biodiversity hotspots and bird migration routes. And by working with local communities to plant them and continually monitor their growth, you can be sure that the trees you're contributing are actually making a difference. So go download Ecosia on your phone or your computer by using my link in the description down below or using this QR code. Thank you so, so much to Ecosia for sponsoring this video and for all the amazing work that they do. And without further ado, let's get back to the video. Reluctantly, I adopted the cat and named it David after David Tennant because I just met them that month. Very large fan. But that super cool namesake did nothing to make me like this glam meow. I continued on with the day, harvesting my parsnips and then heading north to unlock the community center before venturing into the mines for the first time. Rusty sword in hand, I entered the mines, curious to see what kind of Pokemon I would find. And on our journey, we came across a couple Solosises? Solosisi? A gaggle of Solosis and a Parasect disguise disguised as a mushroom. I played whack-a-mole with a diglet for a bit, which felt especially mean, and then was promptly ambushed by a swarm of bee drills. That felt like a good time as any to leave, except that it was actually kind of a bad time, because as soon as I reached my house, I passed out. The following morning, I petted and watered David and crafted up some furnaces to smelt the copper from yesterday's mining trip. Gonna be honest, I'm not sure how much I like it in Palatkin Town. As I was fishing by the river, just minding my own business, Harvey ran into me and shoved his way through. Then Pam, and then Granny and Grandpa, wheeled through me too. Like, hello? I'm just trying to fish. Despite the rude behavior of the villagers that day, I continued to fish into the evening and was rewarded for my persistence. Oh, it's a Finian. After a full night's sleep in bed and not on the ground in front of my porch, I stumbled across this Murkrow chomping on my crops. So excited to spot a new Pokemon, but also really sad about my pokey crops. Mixed feelings, you know? To address this, I crafted a Scarecrow or a Trico on a stick. My little farm was starting to shape up, but I realized I actually hadn't visited Marnie's ranch yet, so I did just that. Whoa, this is like the Pokemon daycare. I checked out the traveling cart too, saying hello to the snorting Venusaur. Oh, it still makes a pig noise, but it kind of fits. <laughs> The traveling cart lady was selling a bunch of Pokemon I hadn't gotten yet, but I have morals. I'd have to catch them myself to enter them into the Poke chest, but that would certainly be made easier with one particular food item. Please have a fish taco for me, Gus. However, I was only met with disappointment at the saloon. Sad, I did some more fishing that evening to soothe my soul and actually spotted something flying overhead as I returned home. Whoa, oh my gosh, it was an, it was an owl. It was a knocked owl. Motivated by this rare sighting, I continued fishing the next day. Given my lack of fish tacos, it was seeming like this was going to be my life for a while since I needed to catch the legend by the end of spring. But I was still holding out hope for a fish taco and resorted to heckling Gus to get one. I need a fish taco, Gus. I need one now. I need one four days ago. At this point, the scope of this 100 days was really starting to dawn on me. But like Ash and all the other trainers that came before me, my journey to catch them all would be a long and difficult one. I must persevere, which for now just meant more fishing. Although it kind of sucked, I reached fishing level five that night, so I was definitely making some good progress. As if the scope wasn't large before though, a lot of changes happened on day 10. So from here on out, we are about to see a large amount of new stuff. The first thing that you may notice is that David is no longer a glam meow. David gives off a magical glow. Evolve David? I was not expecting to be able to evolve my new Litten, but I wasn't about to say no to a Tora cat and neither was my chat. It's looking like a 92% evolved David. I'm not even going to trifle around. We're just going to evolve this bad boy. Let's go. Um, so David literally broke my stream. The entire game just straight up crashed. Like, I'm not even kidding. Noodles of Cat explained to me later that the Litten is the only pet evolution that breaks the game. So maybe they're just too powerful. I don't know. David needs to be restrained. Once we'd recovered from that, I finally got the chance to take in some of the new changes made in the mod pack, including these C dot acorns. Heading to the beach, I passed by Harvey's Pokemon Center and Pierre's Pokemart. Something else I really love too is as I was rifling through the garbage cans, as one does. I spotted this little goober peeking out. It was honestly incredible and even better, when we made it to the beach, we were greeted by the calming sounds of screeching Pokemon. 
Oh, I also added the visible fish mod, which allowed us to see all the Pokemon swimming around in the water. It really brought the world to life and also helped me keep track of which ones I hadn't caught yet. With my fiberglass rod acquired from Willy, I finally spotted the birds making all the fuss. It's Wingle, you <laughs> little goobers. I shooed them away, but noticed a couple more Pokemon on the other side of the beach bridge that I hadn't gotten yet. Honestly though, the ruckus was just too distracting. Oh my God, I gotta get off this beach. There's too much noise happening, goodbye. From the harsh screeches of Wingle to the peace and quiet of the secret woods, I felt a lot better, but then I noticed the one, the only. It's Pikachu. The secret woods was actually a fantastic call because there were also a bunch of new Pokemon swimming in the pond nearby. I sat and fished for a while, reeling up this old TM disc, as well as a Basculin and a Luminion, ending off the day by catching a Sobble. Early the next morning, I received a letter from Robin saying that she'd lost her Teddy Ursa. So I set out to find it, taking a quick detour into town where I spotted these little guys in the square, said a hello to Pierre's Slowpoke, and bought some more parsnip seeds. With that out of the way, I headed into the Cindersap Forest and retrieved Robin's Teddy Ursa. Hello, sweet sweet one. I plopped that little sucker in my pocket, watching a pick a pack fly by as I arrived at Robin's and returned them. Since I was in the area, I decided to do a wee bit of fishing at the mountain lake and noticed this Kadabra warp shrine for the first time, which I thought was an incredibly cute detail. I continued to maintain a healthy distance from David for fear of what they'd do to my PC, and after some fishing by the river, I entered Pam's trailer to find, um... Oh my god! For some reason, Pam's existential and cynical dialogue paired with this this face was absolutely hilarious to me. Each day is just the same as the last. Everyone say thank you to Davis, another wonderful viewer for this monstrosity. I sat with Mr. Pam for a bit, but their presence was just a bit too much. And after that fun interaction, I walked to Gus's saloon and noticed a bunch of new Pokemon related decorations. Oh, it's, a, it's an Ursa ring and there's a little character and there's a, oh. Well, that's really too bad. I scrolled through Gus's menu, trying to ignore the Cubone skull on the wall, but unfortunately, no fish taco. I decided to spend some time fishing in the river next to Joja, which was actually quite calming until... Oh, uh, no! She even stopped to judge me as I reeled in a temple. Casting our wonderful new villager out of mind, I continued fishing for the rest of the day and made it to level six fishing. In the process, being graced by our first legendary Pokemon. Oh my gosh, there's a Mew just sitting here. And just like that, we had made it to the egg festival. As I entered the next morning, I snagged a lawn altaria and some strawberry seeds, spotting a blossom on the table and then proceeding to become a blossom. Before the main event began though, I witnessed perhaps one of the most cursed things of all time. This is, that's the worst moment I've ever had playing a video game, I think. The egg hunt itself went off without a hitch and I won myself the straw hat, which I'll obviously never wear. But maybe the real treasure was the cursed Mr. Pam we found along the way. Never drinking that punch again though. I headed down to the beach the next day and after witnessing the outcry from my chat, I made the executive decision to lower the volume of our resident wingles before spending the entire day fishing on the dock, stopping only to buy more materials from Willy. Brux Bruxious. That's a fish that deserves to be turned into a soup, I must say. And you know, you can spot a Pokemon, catch one with a fishing rod, toss it in a chest, but the truest form of catching them all is eating them. Sorry to all those Bruxious enjoyers out there, but I'm counting this one as a Pokedex entry because although it's in soup form, I choose to believe I've caught it in my stomach. Not a fan of Bruxious, but I do like Rowlet and these little potted cherims. Admittedly, the soup did come in clutch though, because shortly after, I caught a bunch of new fish, including this 26 inch Meryl, which by the way, how does that work? Is it like 26 inches in diameter or like 26 inches long? The world may never know. Anywho, as much as I was growing tired of all this fishing, I did reach level seven that evening. And if I use some food buffs, I'd be able to catch the legend soon. But while hanging out at Pierre's the following day, trying to figure out what crops I had to grow for the community center, I had a kind of a hot take. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna do Joja. I faced some pretty hard pushback from my chat. So we started a comprehensive pros and cons list. Money talks. That's a great point. Joja pollutes the water. That's definitely a con. Oh, Morris. Yeah, that's a con. Oh, it's just like everybody has such good moral points and I'm just tired of Ugh, I'm just tired of putting in the effort. As much as I wanted to go the Jojo route to speed things up, get to other areas faster, and find more Pokemon, the community center was the right thing to do. Because I am the very best like nobody ever was. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna 
be good. The rest of the day was spent in a state of deep moral conflict. Do I do the community center for the good of the town? Or do I get a JoJo membership for the good of my Pokemon collection? After all, we were also in a Stardew expanded world, which if you've never heard of this mod, I have an entire series on it, but it adds a lot of content, namely 27 new NPCs, 50 locations, and 27 fish, all of which had been Pokemonified. I thought through it, and when I woke up the next day, good morning, everybody on this wonderful capitalist day that we have here. I'd had a change of heart. I would be taking the Jojo route. As I harvest my cherry, rost, and lumberries and watered my strawberries, I came up with a plan to make money for my Jojo membership, which can really be reduced down to... Give me clay. Give me clay. Give me clay. And it was going pretty well until... Did I do it wrong? Oh no! Maybe the valley was conspiring against me for choosing Joja. Maybe I was just an inept clay farmer, but I pushed onward, offering a bunch of my fish, veggies, and pokey fruit to the Charizard in my shipping bin so that I'd hopefully have enough money for the membership the following day. And before I went to bed, I did, you guessed it, more fishing. And it was starting to really impact my well-being, I will say. Give me yourself, be in my fish tank. You are mine. Now, what a foolish choice. Day 18 was a very special day because not only did I have enough money for my Joja membership, but it was also Mr. Pam's birthday. So I sauced Mr. Pam some glazed yams that I'd gotten from the saloon and then walked to Morris's office to become a Joja member. But as I left, I felt this terrible guilt inside me. My heart had a little pang and it went, no, not Joja, anything but Joja. And I had to say, be still heart. We need to get to the Crimson Badlands. Now that I was signed on for a Joja membership, I headed to the mountain lake once again because- it's time to fish. It's the best part of the day is when we fish. I hadn't even cast my line before I realized that I was running out of energy and the algae I had would not be enough. So ashamed, I literally turned my screen off to hide from chat and- I didn't need a fish. Guys, I didn't need a fish. Yeah, I ate a fish. A goldine, actually. And I felt bad about it, okay? I ate a Pokemon. There, I said it. I'm a Joja loving Pokemon eating fool. After picking up this Morlul and not eating it, I finished off the day reflecting on my poor choices. Like, would Ash ever eat a Pokemon? Actually, I'm pretty sure he ate a Magikarp in the anime, or like at least thought about it, so I don't want to see any comments about this, all right? Not a single one. Day 19 was another momentous day, because even more Pokemon mods had been added, including this little fella sitting in the fireplace. What a cutie. David the Litten was also nerfed for the potential damage they could cause, and turned back to David the Glamya, which was quite disappointing. But upon checking in on my chests, I also noticed the bug meat had magically transformed into these little goobers, and the horseradishes had turned into oddishes, which was very cute. On my way to the mountain lake, I said hello to the Mightyena in the doghouse, and then once again fished for the entire day. It was much more exciting though, because I caught a Shellos as well as this shriveled up Staryu, and then proceeded to shrivel up myself as the clock struck two, bringing me to fishing level eight. After harvesting my parsnips the next morning, I headed to the museum to drop off the Staryu, and spotted this little Pangoro stuffy sitting in the corner, in addition to a Pachirisu scurrying around next to the bus stop. I finished off this extremely eventful day by chopping trees in complete darkness. Oh, I got a pine echo or a pine co. I don't know how people say that. And thus we awoke on day 21 with merely a week left until the end of spring. Normally this would be exciting, but we still hadn't caught the legend. And since we were only at fishing level eight, my entire plan for catching one was contingent on Gus or the traveling cart selling us a fish taco. But of course, there's no fish taco. There's no fish taco. Oh no! I didn't mean to buy that. Oh. Out of sheer frustration about this dumb $1,000 jar of mayo, I reset the day, catching a glimpse of the three legendary birds and some unknowns on the home screen. At this point, I was furious, so I took my anger out on some trees, planning on potentially upgrading my house for the kitchen as a last resort to cook the fish taco. As I was doing so, I saw a little Zygarde cell just floating around, and with all 450 pieces of wood acquired, I headed to Robin's and upgraded my house. Nervous about our prospects of catching the legend, I spent the rest of that dreary day fishing. Big shocker, I know. But on the upside, I actually spotted the legend in the water for the first time. Like, oh, it's a Dratini. I see it. It's a Dratini. Oh my God. I wanted it so bad. And all I needed was a stupid fish taco. And on day 22, <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. I had never been this excited about a taco before. On the way to catch my Dratini, I spotted a fungus, which felt like a good omen. But the first time Dratini caught the line, I kind of dropped the ball. No, <laughs> you monster. Monster, you demon fish! I tried a more gentle approach with the next one. Hush, sweet baby. 
Sweet, sweet spring baby. But that didn't work either. In desperation, I ate another taco, but I was running out of time. I panicked, and once again, the Dratini slipped through my fingers. So I reset the day. We couldn't catch the legend unless it was raining, something I couldn't guarantee would happen again in the final six days of spring, and I was more determined than ever to catch the legend. I popped over to Gus's for my tacos and set off again. You're safe. You're safe. I hate you. I hate you. And then the KK slider started bumping. Ta da 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 Come to me, fish. I am your mother. Hyped out of my mind with this soundtrack. I had to catch it. Or I mean, I guess not because I didn't. And reset the day once again. But this time would be different because this time I had coffee. Caffeined up, I booked it to the mountain lake and got fishing once again. But yeah, the like 10 seconds I saved with the speed boost didn't help at all. So I reset once more. At this point, I was starting to think maybe I'm not the problem. Maybe the spirits are displeased. So I started the day off with a quick morning ritual. Come to me, legend. Come, come to me. I would like you in my pocket, please. Despite our little fishing chant, I still could not catch the legend. So you guessed it. I reset once again. And geez, I was on my fifth try of day 22 and desperate to leave this Groundhog Day situation. But I needed that Dratini, which meant I needed a rainy day. And like I said, who knows if it'll rain for the rest of the season. I just couldn't deal with that level of uncertainty. So I did what anyone would do in this situation. I messaged blade a bona fide sardu mastermind hello hope you're well <laughs> i was just wondering if there was a way to find out to, to predict the weather ha 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 thank you and after sending out that plea what hello oh crud Blade's calling. <laughs> Hold on. Blade was kind enough to walk me through the complex process of predicting the weather. Blade's child, Dagger, even joined too. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> That's how I feel right now, honestly. Blade guided me through day 22, which entailed scooting around and walking all funky to avoid actually taking any steps. And, you know, I'm really not this kind of Stardew player, and most of this went way over my head. But essentially, the amount of steps you take in a day somehow dictates the weather. So by using my game seed and controlling the amount of steps I actually actually took, I can force it to rain again before the end of the spring. After meticulously tracking my steps for all of day 23, I woke up the next day to learn that I had failed. Tomorrow was going to be a bright and sunny day, which was totally not what we wanted, but hey, at least I was out of the purgatory that was day 22. Undeterred by my failed attempt, I began counting again and suddenly realized that it was the flower dance, so scooted my way there. I had to make sure I wasn't taking any steps, even in cutscenes, which meant no dancing for me, but that wasn't really an issue because I don't have friends anyway. By the end of the day, I'd managed to attend a whole festival without taking a single step, but I still needed to take eight more steps to trigger the next rain day, so I counted them carefully before going to bed. And let me tell you, all this scooting was not in vain, because the weather report the following day revealed that it was going to be raining on day 26. I spent the rest of that afternoon preparing for the fishing trip of a lifetime, getting some bait and trap bobbers ready for what was likely our last chance to catch the legend. I settled into my usual fishing spot, and on our first encounter, I battled with this Dratini for, I'm not even exaggerating, nearly two whole minutes. But after a long fight, the Dratini bested me. I'd worked too hard for this though. I couldn't give up now. And on our second chance, I finally caught it. Thank you, Yoba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was pure relief. Like, I could have cried. Actually, I think I did. I ran home with the little guy and plopped him on the table just to make sure I didn't accidentally turn him into Dratini Sashimi. After that absolutely harrowing string of events, we were over a quarter of the way into our playthrough, and I decided to take the rest of the month to relax and do some non-fishing activities. It happened to be Emily's birthday, so after a quick stop at the Empoleon Festival, Mountain, I headed into the mines to kill a ninjask and acquire a topaz to gift her. The next day was Sunday, so I headed to the traveling cart where I saw that the Venusaur had made a little friend. I also realized that it was the last day of the season, and I really wanted to see what the Junimo plush would be, so I hung around the playground waiting for 12 p.m., and, uh, the plush was an Appleton, but not actually. Like, w do we count it, even? Like, I think, I think I'm gonna count it. I spent the rest of that day in the mines, and with the exception of killing a 
couple Weedles and Zubats. It was pretty uneventful. Things quickly picked back up though, because the next day was our first day of summer. And with a new season here, there were a ton of new Pokemon to discover. These included an Alolan Exeggutor and a Roserade, which had evolved from Roselia the season before. A new season also meant new Pokemon berries from Pierre's. So for the rest of the evening, I planted and watered a bunch of them. New summer Pokemon continued to appear the next day. And after purchasing the next backpack upgrade, I continued down in the mines, killing a bunch of jumping Vanillites and a Golbat in the ice floors. I managed to make it all the way to floor 54 until I had pretty much depleted all my energy. Oh, hey, Marlin. Don't mind me. Though we'd made a lot of progress, there were still some areas of Pelican Town that we hadn't yet unlocked. So my goal for day 32 was to fix the bridge and explore the other side of the beach. I spent the whole morning chopping trees and fixed up the bridge by that evening, picking up a couple new Pokemon in the tide pools. The progress wouldn't stop there though, because later that night on my very first cast, I caught an Omastar, our legendary fish for the summer. First cast, first catch? It just couldn't have been better. With my Pokecrops coming along quite nicely, I continued my fishing escapades, catching myself a Galarian Corsola and a Relicanth in the mines, as well as a Wimpod and shiny Pukumuku by the ocean. I mean, we were on a roll finding new Pokemon, and it only kept going as I encountered my first Ghastly in the mines. Hello, buddy. I've gotta kill it. And in the fruit cave, there's there's an Applin. It's so cute. Honestly, finding new Pokemon was so exciting and I just didn't want our streak to end. Luckily, I realized there were still a ton of Pokemon that we still had to buy from Marnie. With this in mind, I made getting a coop our top priority, spending all of day 35 preparing the materials and then heading to Robins to get the construction going. While that was underway, I returned back to the mines and decided to take a stab at catching the Ice Pip, which turned out to be a Sfeel. Basically, our two Two major goals in terms of new Pokemon were to get all the new summer fish and continue progressing in the mines. The following day, I fished up a shiny Magikarp and a Gorobus from the ocean, and as I was trucking on through the mines that evening, I saw this scroll and suddenly realized, what kind of Pokemon is the dwarf? To find out who the dwarf was, I first needed to get my hands on some bombs, so I headed back into the mines that night, slaughtering a whole gaggle of Cubones, which felt really, really bad. Guilt-ridden, I passed out in front of Marlin and woke up bright and early the next morning for the luau. Little did I know, this was about to be our most productive day yet in terms of filling out the Pokedex. As soon as I walked in, I spotted a solar cast form on the table, but the main event wasn't the table decorations, the luau pot, or even the free buffet. Surprisingly, it was Pierre's stall. Well, guys, this is a, are these free? What, we, what the heck did we get? There were so many free Pokemon plushies, more than I could carry, so I had to be selective about what I brought home. Obviously, I prioritized the legendary Pokemon like for Quaza, Lugia, Ho-Oh, Sudowoodo, Deoxys, and Kyogre. I was having an absolute field day, quickly emptying my inventory for more plushies. All in all, we added 20 new Pokemon to our Pokedex in a single day, bringing our total to 125. Honestly, I couldn't have cared less if the governor liked the soup. I spent the rest of the evening decorating my home with the new plushies, which made me so happy, except... What the frick? The Snorlax plush turned into a miniature chest? Uh, very confusing. And the fun didn't end there because by the time day 40 had rolled around, our coop was finally complete. I headed down to Marnie's to see what Pokemon I could buy and paid a visit to the traveling cart on the way just to see what was there. Garlic, cave carrot, parsnip. Oh, what? are you? I quickly fell in love, and although it was a whopping $1,000, I bought it anyway, and the chat unanimously agreed on naming it Mr. Egg. Very creative, guys. Wait, I kind of wanted to just be in our hot bar like a little friend. And you may be thinking, are you seriously gonna waste an entire space in your hot bar for the next 60 days just for an egg? The answer is yes. Yes, I am. And that's Mr. Egg to you. With Mr. Egg now occupying this prime real estate in my inventory, I went into Marnie's and purchased a Natu named Snorkel and a Starly named Apricot. While Snorkel looked fine, I was not expecting Apricot to come as an unhatched egg. D is this egg speaking to me? I soon realized though that I should probably get to work on building a silo so that my Pokemon wouldn't be starving in the winter. I mean, to be fair, they're starving right now too, but I don't know, it felt more pressing. I decimated the beach for clay and then headed to Robins to get construction started. And while that was going, I went back to the beach to do some fishing, picking up a Kabuto on the way out. After 
after filling up my silo, I ventured into the secret woods to do some more exploring and came across a river with a bunch of fish I hadn't caught yet. So the next day, I came back with my fishing rod and caught a bruxish of the non-soup variety as well as a milsery. And the next morning, I awoke to three wonderful surprises. First off, our Natsu had grown into a Zatu. Second, Apricot was no longer an egg, but an actual Starly. And finally, both of them had laid pokey eggs, which was just so exciting. Also, I had downloaded another mod that day, which added Pokeball weapons and fishing tackles. For now though, my main focus was on building a barn. So I chopped down some trees, destroying dozens of Pokemon habitats in the process. Like, wow, look at them all go. With all that deforesting done, I had enough wood for the barn, so I headed to Robins to start building it, but unfortunately just missed her. So I went mining instead. This turned out to be a pretty happy accident too, because I came across a bunch of new Pokemon, including this Morlul, which dropped a Krabby when I killed it. That makes so little sense. I didn't want to miss Robin again, so I arrived at her house bright and early and got right to business, moving the chicken coop down a smidge and placing the barn right beside the house. Again, I figured while we're in the area, I might as well hit up the mines, and as I defeated this Noibat, it dropped a Voltorb. At first, I had no idea what this Voltorb was, like I was just confused about like how? But I soon learned from my chat that this Voltorb was in fact a bomb, which when you think about it, makes a lot of sense. This was fantastic timing because I now had the means to clear the entrance to the dwarf cave and when I did, he's a little L gym guy. Talk to Totten, my man. With our barn under construction, I set down some fences on the ranch and headed into town to go through the garbage, but quite unexpectedly. Wow. I've never gotten a garbage hat before. That was violent. And this trubbish is just all naked. After that fun little surprise, I headed to Marlins. <gasps> I've proven myself. For my stellar adventuring and catch em all prowess, I was invited to join the guild, which I was quite excited about. I pledged to be the very best adventurer like no one ever was. And as the 23rd member of the Adventurers Guild, I now had access to new weapons, including different kinds of Pokeballs. Each Pokeball had different stats and a throw quality based on its type, but I decided to pick up an ultra ball and a heavy ball and went directly back to the mines to give my new weapons a spin. As you'd expect, you can use them to whack Pokemon, which is definitely one way of catching them, but these balls aren't just melee weapons. Oh, no way, dude. You can actually throw them. Melee and range bundled into one single weapon. There are nicer ways of catching Pokemon though, and harvesting is one of them. So when I spotted this Cherubi sapling at the traveling cart, I couldn't help but buy it to plant in our Pokemon ranch. I was still getting used to our new Pokeball weapons, and I'd been having trouble, especially with the ranged attack, which was hard to use accurately. But while practicing in the mines that evening, I managed to find a Thunderstone, meaning we could finally make a mayonnaise machine. Some uh, starly mayonnaise, anybody? And as we awoke the next morning on our 50th day, I realized we'd made it halfway through our time on Pokey Farm, but we were definitely less than halfway through our Pokedex. By this point, we'd caught 138 Pokemon out of the 465 possible, meaning we were about 30% of the way done. Luckily, our barn had finished up that morning as well, meaning that once we'd made a bit more money, we'd be able to add a couple new Pokemon to the farm. In the meantime, we still had some summer Pokemon to catch before the end of the season, so I stood on the dock fishing away getting nothing new until oh my gosh we got the octillery that's so good with only one summer fish pokemon left to catch i spent all of day 51 fishing and eventually i got myself the last fish a quillfish. With my fishing obligations fulfilled for now, I decided to shift gears a bit and fill up the new barn buying a mill tank named Rock Lobster and a swine up named Sir Mubis. And after some very successful target practice in the mines, oh my god, you're so annoying. I went to meet Lobster and Mubis for the very first time. What a bunch of cuties. One of the most important ways of getting new Pokemon was by upgrading our watering can, which we hadn't actually done yet. So I grabbed a couple copper bars and headed to Clint's to do just that. Oh my god, that Squirtle has seen better better days. We're gonna have to upgrade that uh, as quickly as possible so that it doesn't experience too much pain. Also, this is a bit off topic, but I just wanted to remind everyone that Mr. Egg is still taking up a beautiful slot in my hotbar, and honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. Day 56 was actually the Moonlight Jelly Festival, which is usually kind of a boring one. I mean, you just kind of watch the squishies bob around, but this time, there was a lot of exciting stuff going on. Oh my gosh, guys. 
the free stuff has reappeared. I grabbed a boatload of new Pokemon and then settled in to watch the Moonlight Jellies, which were actually frillish. The rare green one was the Jellicent too, which I thought was a nice touch. We ended off that day by placing and arranging our new Pokemon plushes, and it's starting to get to that point where the house is becoming unsightly. Like, it's clear I have a hoarding problem, but I vowed to catch them all, and I'm never getting rid of any of them. Not even the Snorlax plush that turned into a chest. As we began our first day of fall, I was very shocked to see that Mubis had fully grown into a pillow swine. Most importantly though, with a new season comes a bunch of new fish, including the fall legendary fish. Funny enough, the legendary fish for fall was literally no problem. I got it on like my third cast of the day and it turned out to be a lantern, which is very precious. As always, we had a lot of other chores to get done in the beginning of the season. So to start off, I headed to Clint's. Oh, and we got our messed up squirtle copper watering can. And then planted some person berries, orin berries, and other pokey crops before catching a bunch of new Pokemon by the the river, including this polywag. Now, by this point, I was starting to worry we wouldn't get as much done as I wanted to before the end of our first year, and the big barrier to doing so was money. As I was mining over the next couple days, I started to notice that sometimes enemy Pokemon in the mines would drop apricot saplings, which sold for a decent amount. However, after trying to farm them for a good bit of cash, I realized it wasn't really worth it for the amount of time and effort it took, so I concocted a new plan to save up enough money for a furniture catalog and craft a loom. With the these items, I could turn yellow couches into cloth and sell it for pure infinite profit. Although the apricot saplings didn't end up working out, I was still collecting them to save up for the catalog, and all this mining wasn't for nothing either, because in the process, we had reached the final level of the mines, obtaining the skull key. The money I was bringing in for mining trips was decent, but definitely not enough, especially since the furniture catalog alone would set me back $200,000, so I knew I needed another, more profitable source of income. And I also knew of a potentially lucrative opportunity waiting for us in the secret woods. After upgrading my watering can from this cursed squirtle to an arguably better sobble, I grabbed a chair from my house and headed to the secret woods in search of some Salal berries, my next big money-making endeavor. If you've seen my Stardew Expanded series, you know this isn't a new or healthy obsession for me. Picking up an Ice Gear rare crow along the way, I ran into a Snorlax blocking our path. But instead of waking him up with a pokey flute or can I even chop him down with an axe? Like, I don't... I don't want to know. Well, I hopped around him and into the secret woods. I scoured the entire area without finding any Salal berries, but I did find something else. What was... What? Did anybody else... What is this? What? What's going on? What is that? Wait, what is... What? I'm so confused. Turns out this mysterious floating basket is just a Stardew expanded glitch. It was kind of precious. It was like, hello. However fun that was, with no Salal berries to be found, I gave up on the idea and headed to the museum to donate some artifacts. Although we're focused on collecting Pokemon and not artifacts so much, donating to the museum will still be important because we eventually need to gain access to the sewers in order to woo our future roommate, Krobus, or whatever Pokemon they turn into. That night, I leveled up our fishing and was faced with a tough choice, but ultimately I went with the angler profession since I desperately needed the money. I just need like a $200,000 loan, you know? The temptation to commit fraud was real, but I shook it off and proceeded with the day, heading to Clint's and picking up my upgraded watering can. Wait, why is it just the head? Oh, that's so disturbing. That's like almost worse. Clint, why did you do this? With a decapitated Zobble head now in my possession, my mental fortitude was quickly degenerating. Here, let's, let me run this by you. What if? I got, I, I, I stopped the Stardew and then I added the CJB cheats mod and I took out a loan from the bank of Pelican Town. It was a devious strategy. Some people might even call it cheating. Actually, I called it cheating like a minute ago, but loans are a real thing. They exist for this exact reason. And if I pay it back, it's fine, right? How about this? We'll let the RNG decide. If I get more than five saplings today, I won't take out a loan. By 5.50 p.m., I was already up four saplings and at 9.40, killed so many enemies and we haven't got no oh, no oh my gosh why did i set that stupid rule with exactly five apricot saplings in my pockets i ran home trying to figure out how the heck i was gonna make two hundred thousand dollars but maybe it wasn't all bad news because as i tucked myself into bed oh my gosh it's a celebi and it's a shiny celebi what the heck the celebi blessed my crops and just the sight of this legendary pokemon reminded me that the fate of these 100 days shouldn't boil down to a stupid rule i made up about saplings it's my destiny to catch them all. Ultimately, it was up to me.
But then I set up a poll. Should I take out a loan? So then it was up to you guys. As the poll ran, I harvested and sold the crops that Celebi had grown, and only a couple minutes later, support for the loan was pouring in. Okay, 81% yes. Oh my gosh. Do we have are do we all have the backbone of a green slime? I gave everyone some more time to decide, and in the meantime, did some fishing. But by the end of the day, it was pretty clear what we were gonna be doing. We can say it's from Professor Oak or something, or my mom is loaded or something. I don't know. And on the morning of day 65, I took out a loan from the National Poke Bank for $200,000. I will pay it back, okay? With the funds secured, I headed to Robin's house, and after so much hard work and dedication, we'd acquired the furniture catalog. But even with the catalog, there was still a bunch of stuff to accomplish before we could get our couch to cloth scheme going, which included unlocking the recipe for the loom. To do this, we'd have to increase our farming level to seven, so I ran right over to Marnie's to get a milker, but instead of Marnie at the counter. Whoa, what? What are you doing in there? Without a milker or any other good way of raising my farming level, there wasn't much to do. So I looked through my new furniture catalog and to my surprise, this was an incredible way to catch a bunch of Pokemon. I got a couple posters and some other wall decorations, including this Delmise and Sunflora. This house is not the prettiest, I will say. But with a bunch of new Pokemon added to the Pokedex, I honestly couldn't care less that the house looked like a mess. First thing the next morning, I headed back to Marnie's finally getting my milker and also buying a couple more bird Pokemon for the coop. Returning home to milk Rock Lobter and Mubis for that sweet farming XP. After catching a Shelmet and a Corefish, my first Crab Pot Pokemon, I went into the secret woods to say hello to our little friend. Uh, oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> oh my God, there it is. It is like my favorite thing. My only goal for day 67 was to catch ourselves some of the Pokemon that only come out late at night, primarily the Midnight Carp one, but I had no luck. So the next morning, I plopped down my little Drifloon rare crow and with renewed determination, set out to catch the Midnight Carp and Lava Eel Pokemon in a single day. I walked down to the lava lake and was feeling pretty good until the clock hit 10 and all I'd fished up was literal trash. Defeated, I moved down to the mountain lake and on my second cast, I managed to pull up this wishy-washy. I ran home satisfied that I'd gotten at least one of the two fish I set out to get, but this little victory wouldn't change the fact that we had bigger fish to fry. And by bigger fish, I mean exploiting the furniture catalog to fraudulently convert couches into cloth. Getting this scam going was completely dependent on the loom though, so I continued getting farming XP by tending to the crops and then headed to Clint's to upgrade the old axe since I'd also be needing a bunch of hardwood to eventually build the horse stable. After a couple days of crop tending and mill tank milking, we had finally reached farming level 7, but even with the loom now unlocked, I still didn't have the pine tar to craft it. I got a tapper going and then picked up my upgraded axe, cracking open some geodes while I was there. I'd managed to get a good amount of new minerals, so I paid Gunther a visit and donated them to the museum, receiving a Mimikyu rare crow as a reward. Now, day 72 was gonna be a big day because it was the Stardew Valley Fair. I headed into town, checking out the shop first, and ooh, 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 there's like a Gardevoir rare crow, and we need the star drop. Okay, we actually have to like put some work in for this festival. In terms of our Grange display, well, this was a Pokemon playthrough after all, so of course we'd be assembling our strongest team. This consisted of a Dratini, a bunch of random water types and with the three remaining spots i put mr egg some milk and a real egg it was a pretty balanced and well-rounded team if i do say so myself mr egg better win this it, with that like penetrating gaze how can he not but when i spoke to lewis i had placed second no <laughs> mr egg like i vowed to be the very best like no one ever was not the second best like a lot of people always are with my 500 star tokens i headed to the gambling wheel and through the power of betting on green I was able to turn my 500 tokens into 4,300, which was more than enough for what I wanted to buy. Triumphantly, I purchased myself a star drop. Oh, it's strange, but the taste reminds you of catching the... <laughs> as well as the Gardevoir Rare Crow. And with my remaining tokens, I got a plate of pepper poppers, because... Why not? The following morning, I went to check on my Krabby Pots and got myself a Shelmet, which I immediately delivered to Vincent. The reason being, I needed to get his hearts up so I could enter his bedroom and get the secret statue from his toy box. Rogmon. Things were going pretty well, and by the next morning, I'd gotten yet another Shelmet in the Krabby Pot, which I, of course, gave to Vincent. Unfortunately, this still wasn't enough to gain access to his bedroom, so I spent the rest of that day mining for geodes in the hopes of finding more minerals to donate to the museum. While I was in the mines doing that, I figured I'd take 
take another stab at catching the lava eel Pokemon, and after fishing up an honestly concerning amount of trash, I finally managed to get my hands on a Huntail. With that feat accomplished at last, I headed to bed and awoke to some even better news. Pintar, Pintar, today is the day, everybody. And thus began our couch for cash scheme. But little did I know, it takes an absolute eternity to convert a whole couch into fabric. Which, yeah, it makes a lot of sense now that I think about it. For this to even be worth my time, I would need to make a lot more looms, which meant I'd need to get a lot more pine tar. So I crafted up another tapper, and after chopping some wood, our first cloth had finished. Cloth sells for 470 oh, but I have rancher, so 564 That's actually a decent amount of money. With another yellow couch doing its thing and more pine tar cooking up for some looms, I headed into town and gave Vincent yet another shelmet. And you know, three shelmets is really all it takes because Vincent finally gave me access to his bedroom. Oh, it is a Pokemon. It's a Loudred. Although this Loudred did not have arms, I thought he was just magnificent and proudly placed him behind my shipping bin to scream at visitors entering the farm. With that task done, I upgraded my axe once again at Clint's and spent the rest of the day mining for copper. And with all the ore we'd been gathering and smelting, I was able to craft a couple more tappers to grow our loom empire. As that stuff worked away, I turned my attention to our next target for friendship, Shane, giving him the pepper poppers that had been sitting in my pocket for like a week. Befriending him would be crucial because it's the only way you could obtain a blue chicken, which of course we've got to do. With my steel axe finished upgrading, I spent the rest of day 79 in the secret woods to collect the final bit of hardwood we needed for the stable, and by the end of the day, we'd gathered pretty much everything we needed to build it. First thing the next morning, I headed to Robins and got the stable going, which was super exciting because I was eager to see which Pokemon our horse would be. And with that finally in the works, I shifted my attention to getting the Humtagoof statue, walking to the ocean with the singular goal of catching the shiny any Pukumuku we needed. But after catching it and bringing it to the secret spot, <gasps> what? It's the same? It was just another Loudred. I was beyond disappointed. But that's okay because we can have a bunch of Loudreds in a line. They can like scream at everybody that enters our farm. <laughs> Though the statue turned out to be disappointing, it was quickly forgotten on day 81 when I saw that all of our tappers had finally finished up. With the new pine tar, I crafted up a couple looms and designated this part of the farm as the yellow couch cash corner. If Mayor Lewis actually enforced the law and order in this town, I'm sure this would be considered illegal, but until then, I'm rolling with it. And with our illegal activities at the forefront of my mind, I honestly wasn't expecting to see this absolute beauty when I walked outside the next day. We are rapidly dashing. As per the suggestion of my lovely viewers, we named our Rapidash Borscht and took him for a spin. And yes, I know Borscht isn't that great of a galloper. In fact, movement seems to be an active source of pain for him, but we love him all the same. Like, I can't explain why it looks so wrong. <laughs> After trotting to Robins, I upgraded the barn and then crafted a bunch more looms before heading to the Spirits Eve Festival. And as with the other festivals, there were a ton of new Pokemon here, including Chimekos, these Pumpkaboos that Emily carved herself. Emily is a monster. As well as a shiny Pumpkaboo, Badoo, and lots more Pokemon in the maze. I ran into Joltix and Galvantulas and passed by a Haunter and Cofagrius on my way to get the Golden Pumpkin. Please move. Thank you. But the golden pumpkin wasn't our only prize. Our loom factory was kind of taking off and starting to pay out a nice chunk of change at the end of each day. Like, look at how much cloth we're getting. After loading up some more yellow couches, I set down our new mischievous rare crow and then headed to Clint's to upgrade our sad little sobblehead watering can to a poltygeist watering can. With the winter here now, I continue to do various tasks around the farm, such as filling my inventory with yellow couches, which is very normal. And with our deluxe barn all finished up, I wanted to ring in the new season by buying a goat, but obviously Marnie wasn't there. Instead, I went to Robin's and commissioned a deluxe coop upgrade to match our new barn. While enjoying the new holiday decorations around town, I ran into a Stantler, which was very, very cute, and then finished off the day by crafting some Voltorbs and digging up a little Torchic statue. Eager to donate my new Torchic to the museum, I hopped on Borscht the next morning, picking up my new Poltygeist watering can, and then handing the statue over to Gunther, fittingly receiving a Combuskin statue as a reward. Once I'd plopped that down next to the coop, I stopped by Willy's to pick up a dive ball, also known as a trap bobber, and went straight to the lake to try and catch our legendary fish for the winter. I'd spotted it pretty quickly, and it actually turned out to be one of my favorite Pokemon of all time. It's a Manaphy. It's a Manaphy. And let's be honest, I typically have a lot of trouble with the glacier fish, but somehow, maybe through my love of Manaphy, I managed to reel it in on my second try. It was just meant to be, I suppose. With day 87 being a Wednesday, I knew that I could catch Marnie at the shop, so I went down there to buy some new livestock. Okay, howdy. Ooh, 
Oh, sorry. Am I interrupting? Gosh. I purchased a go-goat, a psyduck, and since I got to catch them all and keep them in humane living conditions, I bought a couple heaters as well. Passing by a stunky on our way out, I immediately placed down the heaters and said hello to our two little psyduck eggs and our skiddo. With those new animals squared away, I continued to work on our loom empire and quickly realized that we needed more fiber to craft them. So the following afternoon, I went straight to the mines and got farming. While I was there, I also gave Elgem a visit buying an electrode for our Pokedex. And now that we had a duck too, I wanted to start working on getting the pinky lemon statue, which of course requires duck mayonnaise. At the moment though, our Psyducks were still eggs themselves, so I spent the next couple days checking in on them and keeping our looms going. I'd also been thinking of ways to display my Pokemon collection and realized that fish tanks would be the perfect way to show off my water types. I placed a couple in these little tree nooks on the left side of my farm and plopped a bunch of our water Pokemon inside, which I thought looked really cool. It was also at this point that I realized there were a handful of legendary Pokemon I hadn't gotten yet because they were all on the title screen. In addition to the legendary birds, which we'd seen before, there was also a Shaman, a Mew, a Jirachi, a flock of Shatots hiding in the trees, and a Bibberol hiding behind the E. With those little Debbies out of the way, I turned my attention toward one of our largest goals we'd been working toward, which was to have Krobus become our roommate. Initially, I thought we needed to donate a bunch of stuff to the museum, but on this exact day, day 92, I realized that this was technically a Stardew Valley expanded playthrough, which meant that to unlock the sewers, we actually needed to reach five hearts with Marlin. The problem with this, it was now winter and the cutscene where you're given the key only happens when it's raining. So essentially this meant we needed to befriend Marlin and somehow get a rain totem, which is unlocked at foraging level nine and requires pine tar, hardwood, and a freaking truffle oil. I gave Marlin a life elixir that evening and then headed to the festival of ice where I spotted a Clefable ice sculpture and then swiftly lost the competition to this monstrosity and the town fisherman who I've never actually seen catch a fish. To celebrate my crushing defeat, I went to Jojomart the next day and visited this little guy. <gasps> there it is, everybody. It's the coughing in the Joja sail box. And once we'd concluded that fun spotting, I spoke with Morris to unlock the minecarts and fished up some new Pokemon from the mountain lake. Another area that we hadn't thought to check for Pokemon was at the train station too. And right as I was thinking about checking it out, this happened. <gasps> No freaking way. I galloped as fast as my borscht could manage to get to the train and kept my eyes peeled for new Pokemon. I managed to spot a Hippopowdon inside a Team Rocket car as well as some beautiful Cosmog graffiti, so not too bad. Now that a couple days had passed, I went to check in on our Psyducks who had finally hatched and gave them some love, hoping for a duck egg soon. And right after, I paid for the quarry bridge upgrade at Jojomart. Technically, I didn't need the bridge to access the quarry. I mean, I ended up taking the minecarts anyway, but we needed to finish all the community development projects to get to Ginger Island, where a whole boatload of new Pokemon awaited, so it had to be done. While in the quarry, I checked out the quarry mine to see if there were any new Pokemon in there, and after battling my way through a bunch of Yamasks, I claimed my golden scythe and then headed back to Joja, this time repairing the bus to the desert. With this entirely new area unlocked, I was super pumped, so I met up with Mr. Pam the next morning at 10 o'clock on the dot and rode to Calico Desert for the first time. Oh my gosh, that's a whole camera! Oh, 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 guys, 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 guys. It's a little Mr. Egg and it's a little, it's a Cacnea. Of course, all the palm trees were Alolan executors, which I shook for more Mr. Eggs. And upon walking up to Sandy's store, there's a sand true and there's a Salmence up there. I wanted to head into Skull Caverns to see what new enemies were in there. But before going, I decided to catch a sandfish and give the scorpion carp a whirl, as unlikely as I was to catch it. And oh, scorpion carp on the first try? Yeah, I was pretty chuffed with that one. The scorpion carp is my least favorite fish in this entire game. With my new choodle and stunfisk, I marched into Skull Caverns where I immediately came face to face with a flygon and a purple duosion, which I captured by repeatedly bashing it in the head with my pokeball. But we were rocking a copper pickaxe in Skull Caverns, which was extremely inadequate. So I called it quits, satisfied with the handful of Pokemon we'd found. Early the next morning, I headed to Clint's to upgrade our pickaxe and then paid Morris another visit repairing the greenhouse on my farm. As I headed home though, I'd made a crucial and unforgivable mistake. While emptying my pockets, I'd accidentally dropped the original special Mr. Egg in with the normal Mr. Eggs. And worse yet, I hadn't even realized my mistake. Completely unaware of this tragic accident, I finally made myself some Psyduck mayonnaise and ran straight to the saloon to get our pinky lemon statue and... Oh... 
Oh my. I won't lie. I was expecting a Loudred, so this confused me a wee bit. But honestly, I was really happy with our new find and plopped it by the chicken coop before heading to bed. I decided to start things slow the next morning and relaxed with some queen of sauce. And look... Oops, sorry, my bad. A spinda! Satisfied with my new knowledge of chocolate cake, I then moseyed on over to Jojamart and unlocked the final community development project, celebrating by hanging out with Leah and checking out the Tangela sculpture she was working on. I love supporting local artists. I've also paid the Resident Evil Corporation thousands of dollars to build this warehouse, but let's not talk about that. As I mentioned earlier, the final thing I wanted to accomplish before the year finished was to unlock the sewers and find out what Pokemon Crobus was. But without a rain totem, that wasn't gonna happen. Once I'd gotten my pickaxe from Clint and upgraded it to gold, I then headed to the desert to chop down some trees for the foraging XP we needed to unlock the totem recipe. While doing this though, I suddenly realized the horrific mistake that I'd made earlier. You got rid of Mr. Egg? What? I really had no clue where he'd gone, and I did spot a pavilion, which was something, but worried sick about Mr. Egg, I quickly returned home to search for him. Get out of here, imposter. This is the real Mr. Egg. No, no, the last one is. Yes, this is the real Mr. Egg. Okay, wait, why are there four? This is the real. With the world back in its natural order, I then went to the ocean to check out the first day of the winter night market, spotting a couple Rotoms floating on the water, as well as... Look at that! It's a little... One of the little chin... Chin... Chingling? I browsed through the shops and picked up a couple decorative items for the farm before making my way to the mermaid boat, spotting a Fione on the way. Oh my gosh, this is so cute! Are there any new ones here? I'm looking. I'm looking. After watching the pre-marina show, I redeemed my pearl and then entered the submarine for some deep sea fishing. Although there wasn't much time left in the day, I managed to catch a pearl, which is a 0.4% drop rate, by the way, and a chin chow. We still had a couple more fish left to get, so we'd have to return the following day, but until it opened up, I got busy with my farm work. I planted some crops in the newly repaired greenhouse for farming XP, and also stopped by Marnie's to fill up our deluxe barn with flappies and pig nights. As the sun set, I headed to the beach once again, buying a stone dodrio and poplio painting from the famous painter lupini also spotting a vile plume with that business done with i headed back to the submarine and continued catching fish getting an inke and please be a blobfish yes oh my gosh we got a whooper thank you guys have a have a good life down at the bottom of the ocean our business at the night market was still not done for the past two days i'd been praying for a truffle from the traveling cart which is required to craft a rain totem but today was as unlucky as the last with very little time left i started working harder than ever toward unlocking the sewers spending the next couple days chopping trees for xp and then visiting the traveling cart please let there be a truffle please but unfortunately there was no truffle. It was a bit of a mixed bag because we only had nine days left before the year was up, meaning we had two chances left for the truffle. But we'd also finally reached foraging level nine, which unlocked the rain totem recipe. So yeah, it was really going to come down to the wire. There wasn't much to do on day 104 except wait for the next traveling cart. So I just ran around town coming across a pokey flute. And since I had nothing better to do, I took it to the Snorlax in the secret woods to see if I could wake it up. Ready? How do I play this? How do we play this? This is such a day of disappointment. By that evening, we'd also reached farming level eight, unlocking the oil maker recipe, meaning that truly all we needed now was a single truffle and five hearts worth of Marlin's love. Nervously, I approached the traveling cart that Sunday, but like last time, no truffle. We still have a chance. We have next weekend. To make myself feel better, I headed to Marnie's to add some more animals to my deluxe coop. Oh, it's a Baneary! Oh, we're poor. We'll come back. We'll come back. Further upset by my lack of truffle and Baneary, I took my new golden pickaxe and headed to Skull Caverns once again, determined to get deep enough to spot a couple more Pokemon. Sure enough, I found a Shedinja and gave him a little tippy tap before heading home for the evening. Day 106 was a very interesting day because it was actually Joja Day? Literally no idea that was a thing. I'd only ever been to Community Day in my Stardew Expanded playthrough, so I was eager to see what the Joja version looked like. However, I had no clue if there was a specific time or place, so I just headed to the warehouse. Hello? Is this where the Joja Day is? It, I don't think it's in here. So I went to Joja Mart to see if that's where the party was. Yeah, turns out Joja Day is just a day of discounts. Wow, this is so, this is really, wow. So glad that I chose the Joja 
Desert Route. Whoa. After that utter disappointment, I went to see Marlin and gave him a life elixir, bringing him up to the five hearts that we needed. Now, the fate of our hopes to meet Krobus rested on this weekend's traveling cardstock. Honestly, I was so incredibly nervous, but until Friday rolled around, I still needed to be going out and finding new Pokemon. And with my illegal couch money, I bought myself our first Baneri and named it Bopper. That night as I slept, I saw a deli bird flying across the sky, which meant that the Feast of the Winter Star had arrived. And for once, I was super excited to go to the festival because usually they're such a great way to spot some new Pokemon, but unfortunately, I didn't actually find anything we hadn't seen before. Got a Blackberry Cobbler from Sam though, which was sadly not a truffle and definitely baked by Jody. I wasn't too disappointed about this useless gift though because it was now Friday, which meant it was our second to last chance to get a truffle. I gave Venusaur a good luck pat and then checked the stock, but unfortunately, no luck. Undeterred, I continued on with my day, upgrading to a Wilmer Water and Canic Cleanse and praying that the last Sunday of the year would be a truffly one. Our second to last day on the farm was honestly spent just hoping and praying for good luck. And on our very last day of the year, I picked up my Wilmer Watering Can for good luck and then headed to the traveling cart. Please, please. This is our last chance at redemption. Crab cakes, pale broth, quillfish, rhubarb, salmon berry, yukumuku, fish taco, Indian tulip. No! <laughs> I was gutted, but it was all right. I told myself it would have been so utterly disappointing to just buy it from some random merchant. A foreign truffle from some random pig? No, thank you. And I mean, sitting in our home filled to the brim with Pokemon, I'd have to say we accomplished quite a lot in our first year of being a Pokemon trainer. With a barn and coop filled with Pokemon, tons of rare crows, dozens of water types in our outdoor aquarium, and of course, far too many plushies, we had caught 241 out of the almost 500 Pokemon in this mod pack. From Ginger Island to Stardew Valley expanded locations like the Crimson Badlands and the Highlands, there is still a lot more to do, so I hope you'll stick around for the next 100 days in my journey to catch them all. I actually streamed all of our journey so far here on YouTube, and I left a link in the description to a playlist of all those episodes if you're interested. And again, make sure to go download Ecosia using my link in the description and start planting trees with me just by searching the web as you usually would. And yeah, I will see you guys next time. Bye!